exciting thing here in the next few minutes that I think are going to uh, touch our hearts in a very special way. And uh, you can see that uh, we have a few extra people up here, and uh, we're going to spend some time together talking about family. Now, one of the interesting things about family is that family, God created family before sin entered the world. We all know that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. We know that God created Adam and Eve. He created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created us as his creation, male and female. And then he told us to be fruitful and multiply, to have children. And so family is one of God's perfect plans for us. Now we also know that living in the city and struggling areas where we are is, is often hard on our families. Since I've been at the conference, I've talked to you. This is you, not us up here. I've talked to someone whose daughter was, got pregnant and she wasn't married. Talked to someone who had a child that was considering suicide. Talked to another family whose child had run away from home. Talked to another family whose child was totally depressed in the school they were in. These are just you in the stories I've heard in the last two days. I've had the privilege of being married to my wife Ann for 31 years and we've raised three children in Lawndale on the west side of Chicago, Angela, Andrew, and Austin. And we've had our struggles. I've shared many of them with you over the years. And so we want to come and have an honest dialogue. And so this morning we have four panelists that are here and uh, we're going to have them share with us their journey, their time of raising their children. And so right here is, this is Erica and Sonia and Joseph and Carrie. And uh, they're going to just, uh, if first of all, you know, I'll let them introduce themselves to us. So Carrie, why don't we begin with you? I'm uh, Carrie Casey and in Lawndale. Is that Carrie uh, Walden Casey? It's Carrie Walden Casey. And my dad loved uh, Henry David Throw and Emerson and all of that. And when we passed it together at Lawndale, my name is Kerry Walden Casey, and this short white brother that can't get the net, let alone the rim, his name is Wayne Leroy Gordon. <laughs> and so, uh, but anyway, we've both been married for 31 years, and my bride, Melanie, I met her in geography class at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and we have, uh, yes. Yeah, we have four children, uh, three children grown, and Melanie and I kept having fun. Now we have Chance. He's 11 years old. But, um, and we have two, we have two uh, beautiful grandchildren, and um, I always wanted a son named John Perkins, and that's another story. Uh, a grandson, if you will. So we have a grandson named John Perkins, but that's another story. Uh, all right. Thanks, Kerry. Joseph? Uh, my name is Joseph. I serve as the associate pastor of Lundell Community Church, and I'm a lifelong resident. Um, of, um, of Chicago West Side and uh, married to a beautiful young lady named Stacy uh, who grew up on the same block I did and we've been married for 12 years we have uh, four kids uh, two adult sons and um, been part of Lundell Community Church for over 30 years uh, one of the original uh, original members and also a co-founder of Hope House Ministry my name is Sonia Stewart and I also live on the west side of Chicago in Humboldt Park and I'm uh, the executive director of a community development corporation there called The Oaks. We're serving kids and families predominantly around ed education issues. And I am also married to my very best friend of 13 years. We met in college. I was a college basketball player. He was a college football player. Athletes got together and uh, we have four children an adult daughter who um, came to us as a teenager, Sheree, she's 22, and then I have a nine-year-old son, Trey, seven-year-old daughter, Micah, and my youngest is Jaden, she's six. I'm Erica Phillip. I'm originally from Chicago, but we live presently in Miami. I work for an organization called Urban Resurrection, which is a small community development organization here. Um, I head up the Ujima Initiative, which is essentially a part of our organization that does community organizing, um, organizing neighbors around issues that they want to see changed. Um, I am married to Michael Phillip. We've been married for eight years and we have three beautiful children. We have Isaac who's five and we have two-year-old twins, Jerusalem and Tizita. 
Now, uh, we, we've had a chance to really, I wish we could have brought you up into my room last night because we had this wonderful chance and we talked for a couple hours about raising our kids together and our family and our goal is to do that. And you know, now you, 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 you have these two girls who are twins, but that's a little bit unusual, right? I mean, tell, tell us a little bit, what's different about that than just having twins? <laughs> My girls are from Ethiopia, actually. We adopted them when they were six months old, and um, they're identical twins. They're just a blessing and a joy to us. Yeah, so we have adoption here. Joe, you have uh, two adult sons, both in their 20s, and tell us about that. Uh, well, uh, my two adult sons, um, uh, one of them came by way of um, my indiscretion when I was um, um, a young adult. Um, and uh, his name is Joey and uh, my wife had a son also so we have a blended family and uh, so so now we have two of those sons and and uh, it's, it's, it's it's something that 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 has had been a struggle and a challenge for us um, in in Chicago on the west side of Chicago with with, with our two of those sons so I think what's 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 significant about our group is that we have blended families, we have adoption that takes place, and then we got one old man that's a grandpa. All right, and uh, so, you know, there's there's other things that that yeah. All right, brought his picture book. You know, grandpas always have pictures. Well, we want to jump right into some of the some of the details of this. Um, and, but, but before we do that, why don't you all just tell us, maybe in a minute or so, uh, the context of your ministry. You all kind of told it, but tell us a little bit of what you do so we have a, a better flavor of that. And Sonia, why don't you go ahead and start. The Oaks was created uh, to serve kids around academic needs and really to serve their families and to come alongside and support them. I was a high school teacher. I've taught in Watts and South Central and Metro Nashville. And I think what's going on in the education system in our country is catastrophic and unjust. And so in Humboldt Park, we are coming together to mentor kids, to partner with schools, but also to look at ways to raise up stronger schools and participate kind of in education on the ground. We also deal with reform efforts and advocacy so that we can work towards systemic change in education as well. All right, so we have an executive director. Now we have an associate pastor. Joe, what do you do in that? Whatever coach don't do. <laughs> no, actually, um, I head up uh, what we call the Skinner Room Ministry, uh, where at the church, you know, people that have concerns that um, they don't feel like they can handle and deal with, we um, have um, an opportunity for them to come into a room, what we call the Skinner Room, and they come and people uh, console them and to pray with them and help them. And also, I um, head up what we call the uh, uh, Prayer and Meditation, which is a, a Wednesday evening service that we hold for we uh, for about an hour or so, helping people to understand what prayer is all about and how it can affect change in their life. And also uh, do some preaching and teaching and um, uh, just various things throughout the ministry, dealing with injustice and really trying to help people in our community understand uh, that Lundell Community Church is there for them to help and assist them to grow into uh, the knowledge and wisdom of who Jesus Christ is. All right. Thanks, Joe. Erica, tell us a little bit of context of your ministry. Yeah, we live in West Coconut Grove, which is the oldest black community here in Miami. Um, it's pre pre predominantly um, Bahamian Americans and Jamaican Americans. Um, I head up the Ujima Initiative, which is basically organizing neighbors around collective things that they would like to see changed and um, drawing out of their strengths and assets and organizing them around different things. We're presently working on little victory gardens in their yards. Um, we have another dimension to urban resurrection that is called Beats, and it's bringing eternal arts to the streets where we use urban art forms to um, do basically youth, uh, community youth development. We've been in the community for two years. Um, so the first year was primarily spent building um, relationships, and we're finally at the point where we're really starting to dig deep into the community and starting to see some movement, which has been great. Great. Kerry? I was so inspired in what Dr. Perkins was speaking about earlier concerning the family and fathering. And I have the privilege to be the uh, CEO at the National Center for Fathering, fathers.com. And every child deserves a father, father figure, or a grandfather in their lives. And when they have that, they really do very well. But we inspire and equip men to be involved in their children's lives, whether they're divorced, stepdad, non-custodial, you name it. 
a child needs a dad in their lives. All right, great. Well, that's a great work. All of you have uh, great works that you're doing, and uh, let's, let's jump right into school and education. Obviously, schools are very hard. How, what do we do with our children when they reach school age, and how do we deal with that? We deal with it in a lot. Let's, let's find out how all four of them have dealt with education. And Erica, do you mind? Can we start with you about you have a five-year-old? Sure. We have a five-year-old who's in kindergarten, so the school thing is a real um, an issue that we've dealt with just recently. Um, it was a very hard decision trying to decide where to send him. Uh, we very much value him interacting with kids from our community, but the school is, a, is an F school, and so there was some, we weren't feeling comfortable about sending him to that school um, academically. And so we talked about charter schools, we talked about Christian schools, um, we researched the Christian school around and just felt like it wasn't the place for us, it wasn't diverse enough, we just felt like there was kind of a, um, there was a disconnect between his world and, and the school there, so we decided that wasn't a good option. We thought about homeschooling. We landed finally eventually on a charter school, um, and we're comfortable with him there, although it's a constant, you know, you're constantly evaluating, is this the best place for him? You're constantly evaluating what worldview is being fed to him, and you know, you can see it come out in him in different ways because he's very involved in our ministry. We feel like when he's at school, we can see him. He says he's the only missionary in the whole school, so he's always trying to, he's always trying to do community organizing in the school, essentially. It's so funny. Um, but yeah, it constantly is a battle of just reevaluating. Is he where he needs to be? Um, and I just really believe that we should just take, for us, it's just one year at a time and mm. We'll just, if there's any point we feel yeah. like he shouldn't be there, we'll remove him. That's, so. that's great advice. I know that's, Ann and I had that same thought on our education is yeah. just one year at a time, you never know, and sometimes it's even one day at a time. Yeah, but that's true. Joe, tell us how you are handling education. Uh, well, uh, we have, Stacy and I, we have been really struggling with education from the time that our kids um, were three years old. Um, our daughter, Sarah, uh, we struggle with um, what to do in regards to education with her. Uh, we tried charter school, we tried private school, we tried um, uh, public school, and um, nothing seemed to uh, really work for us. Um, and so we happened upon uh, 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 a school called Chicago Virtual Charter School. And uh, we did some investigation, um, and then we went to a couple of meetings about this uh, particular school, and um, it was something that was new, and, and we, we took interest in it. Um, Explain what a virtual school is. Okay, virtual school basically is, a, is, is partly um, a school online and partly school um, inside a, a, a schoolroom a school uh, setting. And um, it's, it, it's something, in, it, it, it's, it, it's the first um, um, uh, virtual charter school in Chicago. It's the first time it ever happened in Chicago. And um, it's a school where the kids are able to uh, get online and have access to their teachers uh, throughout the whole school day, and they can do uh, majority of the work there. So your girls are at, are, they're at home? Uh, yeah, they're at home, but we don't call it home school. I like to always call it school at home, uh, because it was an alternative to uh, the public school system, because uh, we really struggle. Uh, I have about five schools in, uh, 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 in proximity to where I live, uh, but... I, don't know. I, I really never would have uh, even thought about sending my kids to the schools because of the environment of the, the classroom. And uh, we really wanted our kids to be in a safe environment, also get a quality education at the same, same time. So um, the virtual charter school lends us that, that gives us the opportunity, it affords us the opportunity to be able to uh, really primarily um, uh, spend more time with our kids. Uh, because we found that when our, our kids in school, <clears throat> They spend about eight hours in school, so they're influenced by the students, they're influenced by, I mean, their classmates, they're influenced by the teachers' values. And so uh, my wife and I, we really wanted to, uh, uh, to really work to have our kids to uh, uh, take on our values. So, so it really gives us a great opportunity, and uh, uh, we've been in uh, the virtual child school for three years. And, uh, now, wait, I'm going to interrupt you. Okay. you. You're talking like this, like we, I still don't understand this, oh, and, okay, I, and I know you, all right? What, tell me how you make this work. <laughs> How do okay. you make a school work with uh, two little girls and a computer? Okay. Yes, uh, what, what, what Ch uh, Chicago Virtual Charter School does, it provides you with a computer printer for each child, 
and then it also provides you with um, a, a neutral site where all the kids can come uh, once a week and uh, they, they work primarily on uh, two subjects each year um, and right now we're working on math and, 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 and science and uh, the kids meet once a week for two hours and, it, and, and it, this covers what I, I struggled with in the beginning of virtual charter school is uh, uh, the socialization but my kids are provided with that and then uh, the, uh, the diversity of the schools my kids come home they talk about their, their Muslim uh, uh, um, uh, 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 classmate, they talk about the Asian classmate, and so it's it's great for me in that, and then also they get the socialization uh, with the church ministry also. Now, uh, how about Stacy? Uh, Stacy is primarily the uh, uh, the educator. Uh, I got fired uh, the, my first year uh, of teaching, uh, and uh, and it, it, it was it, it was orchestrated through my seven year old. Uh, she she led the charge. Uh, I'm I am the disciplinary. I'm the disciplinary in the house, and so I kind of carried that over into the teaching, and, and they revoked against me, and they fired me, um, and, and, and they, just, they just recently allowed me to, uh, to come back in as the substitute uh, 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 history teacher. So, so, so my responsibilities has been reduced uh, because uh, the, the, the virtual charter school actually does everything that the public school does. Uh, we have field trips. Uh, um, um, and, 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 and we do everything basically just uh, the public school does. And I've been reduced to the uh, lunchroom teacher. Uh, I am the field, treat, field, field trip teacher also. And, 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 and so those are my responsibilities primarily. All right, um, All right Joe. But it's, I'm it's a, awesome. I, and, and one of the things that Joe has, and his wife Stacy has done is that Stacy's a nurse. And so she works the night shift, comes home. And then she's with the kids and their computer. And then Joe, they call, he, they call him out of our meetings at church regularly to go home and get the lunch, all right? But uh, let's, let's hear from Sonia. You have three school-aged children, right? Yeah. yeah. This education has hit our family dead on. It's a very, very hard thing to navigate, and it's been a huge challenge for um, us as a family. We moved back into Chicago almost two years ago, so my son was going into the third grade and a first grader and a kindergartner. And I don't know how it is in your cities, but in my cities, if you're not satisfied with your immediate you know, local schools that they can just go to, the immediate local public schools, our schools are selective enrollment and magnet schools and lottery schools, so they're extremely difficult to get into, and even more difficult to get into if you have a child who's not a kindergartner. And my oldest child was a third grader. So when we're coming back into Chicago, that's confronting us, where we can't get into public schools that have these high standards that we're hoping for for our kids. So we had looked, and, and we, our son had been in Christian school environments, and so we were exploring some Christian school environments, and we found one that was in Humboldt Park with us that we felt pretty excited about. It came recommended to us, and so we enrolled our three kids there. And very quickly, it became obvious to me that the standard of education in that environment was not rigorous enough and was, didn't, didn't adhere to the academic standards that I had for my kids. And that was really hard um, to deal with. And I talked to teachers there and I talked to um, school principals there and I said, you know, academically my children aren't as challenged as I'd like to see them. At the end of the first week of school, my first grade daughter was, they told me she is already at the end of our first grade curriculum and we think she should be in the second grade. And I said, she's an excellent student, but she's not a second grader. Mm. She's a first grader and she needs to be able to stay in a first grade classroom. And I had a teacher at that school look at me and say, you know what, sweetheart, you're in the city. These are urban kids. And as an educator, and as a mother, I looked at her and I said, that does not mean that the academic standard and the way that we teach our students should decline. And I think as believers, yeah. Yeah. I think as a believer, we don't need to sacrifice discipleship and we don't need to sacrifice a nurturing environment for a rigorous academic curriculum. And that's what I was looking for. So after a semester, my husband and I really wrestled with what to do. Do you move kids in the middle of the school year? And um, we found a charter school that was opening. And the only reason we were able to get in was because it was a new open and they hadn't filled their spots and we were able to get in even though um, the lottery system was in place because it wasn't full yet. And so we moved our, our kids to a school, a charter school on the north side. And it's been a good fit. I think when it comes to this issue, it's hard to feel like you have an excellent choice. And that's been difficult. So we continue to struggle. 
and there are things that confront us in that school, but um, they are in a charter school on the north side, and we feel we feel good about where they are right. right now. Thanks, Sonia. Now, Carrie, in your role as the uh, CEO at uh, Fathers.com, uh, yeah. you have a program that's really trying to help right. all kinds of schools. Tell us a little right. bit about that. We were joking and making fun of Joe being fired and all that, but one of the great things is that Joe is involved in his children's lives. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yes, and then their education. We have found from research, Wayne and you all, that when a dad is not there, child more likely to drop out of school, more likely to be involved in crime, girls more likely to get pregnant. But it is a fact when a daddy's involved, the statistics turn the other way. And we have a program called Watchdogs, Dads of Great Students. Usually it's the woman that's involved in the children's education. Dogs. Dogs, Dad. dads of great students. And it started through the Jonesboro shootings in Arkansas. Oh. And so what we do, and you can go to fathers.com slash watchdogs, but dads take one day out of the year that they're at their children's school. And they're there watching the kids get off the bus, watch, uh, being in the lunchroom, eating lunch with that child. I get to do that with my 11-year-old boy, Chance. I'm sitting in the hall one day with two students going over the states of this great country. A little girl walks out of a classroom, sees me with these two students, and she stops and sees me with this watchdog shirt. And she says, hi, Mr. Watchdog. <laughs> she didn't say CEO. But the point is, right there with, uh, where Vera May and where John live in Jackson, we're in almost every school in Jackson, Mississippi, where dads that are divorced, stepdads or whatever, that's a way that they can connect with their uh, kids, and it cuts down on the violence. We're in the town hall meetings from the White House to the outhouse because dads are involved in PTA now, and they're sitting there with their students. And um, you need to have this in your, your school. We're in 780 schools across America right now. Our vision and goal is to be in every school in America where dads mm -hmm. involved in their children's yeah. education and they can yeah, make yeah. Fathers.com slash watchdogs, and uh, we can be more involved. Sonia, I want to ask you to start with another subject and start with you. Uh, so clearly education is one of the issues, but there's other issues that are hard. And, uh, you know, just like yesterday I said, it ain't easy, but it can happen. And there's pain, there's struggles, and family is one of those. And so, Sonia, why don't we begin with you, and why don't you tell us a couple things that are hard for you as a mother and a parent raising your children in the environment that you're in, in the inner city? Yeah, as I was thinking about this, um, there are a lot of things that are difficult. As my life and yours, I'm sure, there's huge challenges. I think one of the challenges for us that um, was apparent, has been apparent every single time, or every single day that we're there, is um, the, the pressure that we get from our families on the outside that really look at us and think we're crazy. And most specifically, my husband grew up in an urban environment, and he had a mother who struggled. She didn't graduate from high school, and she has made enormous sacrifices to see her son, my, my husband is one of two, two boys through college and degrees and into um, a different place in life than she was able to give them. And she looks into her boys and then into my children, her grandchildren, and she has this hope that they would get to be raised in an environment very different than what her boys were raised in. So it's been a real challenge for her specifically to see us make choices, intentional choices, to go back to the environment that she spent her whole life getting mm. her sons out yeah. of. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge for us to explain why we're there. And she looks at us and she says, I love you. I agree that there is need there, but I work so hard yeah. to, get, to get you out. And so that's a, that's a challenge that confronts us and um, one that we, we deal with very regularly. And she, she was successful in her goal to raise her son. Uh, Sonia's husband went to college, played pro football for five years, and now is a football coach at Northwestern University. That you, and you live where you live. It's not close to Northwestern. You live there by choice. And uh, I can see that. Continue on. But I, I want to know that Grandma did a good job. Grandma did a great job. I want to be like Grandma. She's an amazing woman. She did. Yes. Uh, so that's one of the things that is, is a constant challenge, is, the, is just that tension. 
I think another thing that has confronted my family um, since we've been in Humboldt Park and in the environments we're in is, as, as Wayne said, we have been in different environments. And my husband, because he played pro football and we, we did that for several years in the early years of my children's lives, this environment that we're currently living in is pretty different from other environments that they know. And so we've lived in communities that are very different from the one that we're in right now. And so in the low-income community that we're living, um, my kids struggle a lot of times with fear. They're afraid of the streets that we live on. They're afraid sometimes of the things that they see. And they're able to articulate that core fear. And it's really interesting to have three young children who, in, who view their environment uniquely different and to be able to, as a mother, help them navigate those very real and tangible emotions. Micah, my seven-year-old, one story about her, when we moved into our house, um, we were in L.A. for a while, and she was very scared in our house in L.A. And we moved to Chicago, and I said, Micah, what do you think about, about this house? What do you think about our block here? And she said, Mom... I think this might be a little bit better. And I said, well, baby, why? And she said, Mom, we live on the second floor, and I get to sleep on the top bunk. All right. Which means that if somebody gets in, I'll be the last one they get, you know? <laughs> and it's just interesting the way their minds work, but just the fear that, um, that my children encounter daily has been a constant struggle to remind them that our protector is, in fact, Jesus Christ and that he loves us deeply, and that his desire is safety for us, and um, to communicate that to children in a real way where they feel safe um, is hard. Okay, thanks, Sonia, for sharing that with us. Uh, Joe, you have a blended family, and uh, you know, what, what some of the difficulties that uh, you've faced, even though you're indigenous to the community, you've made a constant choice, you and Stacy, uh, to remain in the community, to raise your family there, uh, and we're, we, you know, that's such an important value of Christian community development to have remainers like you who stay and uh, you could leave. But what are some of the, a couple of the difficulties that you face as an indigenous person uh, raising your family there and even the blended part? Uh, well, um, my two adult sons, um, uh, the struggle is to, um, the struggle has been, I'm sorry, uh, is to just, um, try to uh, raise them up to um, understand how Christ loves them and, and can affect change in their life and then to see um, how the world actually has sucked them into uh, that environment and um, it, it's just a constant struggle and a prayer for us each and every night for uh, our two adult sons and 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 you know one is working and working well and doing well and one is really struggling because of um, um, uh, being um, diagnosed with uh, uh, bipolar, so so that's a struggle for us to know that they are out there and and uh, they're trying to live their life the best way they can without um, getting caught up in the drugs and the police brutality and the, all the things that we struggle with. Uh, but also um, um, uh, the struggle of of paying taxes in a community or in a city uh, and still yet having inadequate schools. And, uh, and that has been a major struggle for us, and that's why Chicago Virtual Child School was so important to us because it provides the, the, the curriculum, uh, the, same, the same set of curriculum that it provides for the public school. So it gives us an opportunity to really work well with our children. And then also um, um, the, uh, the struggle of uh, inadequate businesses in the community. I grew up and uh, I was able to walk to the store and then I, w I was able to see me in the store and I was able to purchase something out of the store and it was of good quality. Uh, but of course in our community today, uh, I can't allow my, uh, my two little girls to walk to the store. I mean, it's not safe for them to walk to the store and they struggle with that. They struggle with not being able to go outside and stand on the front and, and hang out with their kids. And um, I live in an area where, you know, um, gun, gun, Gun violence, you know, is 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 something that happens on a regular basis. Uh, uh, but then being able to um, uh, provide them still with safe environments by going outside of the community and coming back into the community. So uh, we we have worked to um, offset, you know, being into the community by going outside of the community and engaging a um, a number of things that way. Uh, but it has been just a constant struggle in that uh, for us in that way. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, what tell tell the story of Sarah and the person she met in a swimming pool, your daughter, Sarah. Well, actually, um, uh, yeah, one of the, well, a number of things that we do to uh, help our kids to have a healthy, um, um, just a, a healthy upbringing is that uh, they are into um, 
um, different uh, activities, uh, 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 tumbling and uh, gymnastics and swimming, and, 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 and that provides a, a, a wonderful uh, just, um, uh, uh, just break from, from, from where we live. And uh, just recently, my daughter had the privilege, because she's on a, a wonderful swimming club, swim club, both of them are actually on a, a great swim club uh, in Chicago, and they're doing really well in that. And now my, my, my elder daughter had the privilege to, of uh, swimming in a pool and practicing with Michael, Michael Felt. You know, so that has been an incredible experience for her. So I can't really talk to her now because she has seen the yeah, celebrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so I'm not on her pay grade in that. Uh, but, but, you know, those are the things that we do to offset, yeah. you know, being in the community uh, by providing them with uh, extra yeah. curricular activities. Searching, activity. for, searching, searching for, for activities. activities. I think yeah. that's something that we all have faced raising our families is some of the activities that we want children to be involved in aren't in our exact community. Yeah. So we have to go outside of it sometimes to do that. And yeah. you've really modeled that for us in, in a great way, uh, Joe. Uh, Erica, tell us a little bit of some of the things that have been hard for you trying to do ministry and even raising a family. I think one of the biggest challenges for me personally as a mom, I was very engaged in, in ministry with, alongside of my husband for many years prior to having children. And so there was a big adjustment when we had children of what does my life now look like. And there's a continual struggle within me of this deep, deep con biblical conviction of family and the value of family and the importance of pouring into your family. and. I've seen so many other people in ministry neglect their family for the sake of ministry, and so I was very de am very determined that that would not be something that we would neglect. And at the same time, there's a deep conviction inside of me for justice and for the fatherless and for the poor, and I can't, I can't neglect either one of those very, very strong convictions. And so for me, there's always an internal, uh, an internal struggle of, Okay, did I go too far in this direction? Let me pull back the reins. Okay, I need to focus more on my family. Let me pull back the reins. No, I need to, you know. And so for me, it's been a real balancing act. And what kind of where I'm at right now is all along, I've always brought our children with us to the things that we do. And our children are very involved in ministering to our neighbors. And they're always in the community with us. And, um, kind of where it's a little bit more difficult for the twins because they're so young although they're always ministering relationally to our neighbors and loving on them but for our son Isaac for our five-year-old his interaction is a little bit more tangible we have community meetings block meetings where we're talking about different issues and he's always very involved in those he's always asking mommy where's that when's our next Carter Street meeting when's our next Carter Street meeting and he, he raises his hands in the meetings, and he says, one, at one point we were talking about how to love our neighbors better, and all of us were dialoguing on that. And little Isaac raises his hand. He's waiting patiently. We said, Isaac, what do you want to say? And he goes, I think we could just love our neighbors as ourselves. It's that simple. Yeah. So it's great just to see way. It's a struggle for me, but it's a blessing for me to mm -hmm. bring my kids into it. I feel like it makes our ministry so much more powerful and more rich because we're a family ministering to families and um, but it is a struggle it is a struggle yeah. to balance that and to make them feel like there is still a part of their life that maybe is not always focused on our community that there that we can still have family time and we, d we yeah. do have rhythms in our life of family time and things like that that protect our family in the midst of living there do you want to share a little bit about, weren't you missionaries in Africa? Do you want to talk a little yeah, about that? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the biggest struggles for me in the past three years, we used to live in um, East Africa, and it's been a passion of mine since I was 15 to live there. Um, we've worked with in all different places and seen a lot of grief and trauma, and coming back to the States, although I worked in the inner city in Chicago, so I was familiar with working in the inner city, but coming back to the States was a real jolt for us. Our son Isaac, um, he had some sickness issues that led us eventually back to the States after much wrestling with his physical symptoms. He was having like 20 seizures a day. It was, it was terrible. Wow. Um, so we came back to America hmm. very uh, kind of disillusioned. And really for me, it's been three years of really working through the loss of a dream and grieving that and um, and it's still very much a part of me and obviously it's a very much a part of our family having Ethiopian children um, something that we hold very 
very dear. And so it is a wrestle, it is a struggle for me. Um, but I have seen God's grace in bringing us here, and you know, kind of kind of putting together both both international experience and urban experience, and kind of meshing those passions. Um, but it has really been a struggle for me internally of just saying, God, this is not about me. This is about you. And though this is my heart and this is my passion, I have to release it. And I, it's a daily thing, though, for yeah. me. Well, and, you know, we, we really want to just tell you how much we appreciate, you know, when you sense a dream and sense what God's calling you to do, but when you had to put your son ahead of your own dream that you thought God had called you to do, and because of his illness, to come back to the States. I know that was a hard decision. And uh, we really appreciate you telling us about it. And I know it's tender for you. But we, we appreciate your modeling for us, uh, family, and in the priorities in the kingdom of God. So thank you for that, Erica. Carrie, you're, uh, maybe you could just talk with us just a little bit. You know, you, you know quite a bit about the importance of fathers. You've alluded to it a couple times. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've learned and what you do at the National Center for Fathering and the importance of fathers and how we might even help get other fathers involved. I'm really thrilled of how I heard Renee share last night of what you shared yesterday, Wayne, in terms of being still and know that I'm God. I had a godly father that raises me more now from the grave than when he was here. But as I, I remember your dad used to, used to tell you regularly, Carrie, it's nice to be important, but it's more, more important, important to be nice. nice. Yes. And I Wayne, remember him telling you, sent you that. Me, and Wayne sent me a plaque, and I have that in my study now. And uh, Leroy, he's just on it. I mean, the short white brother... <laughs> He can't get the net, let alone the rim, but he stands tall to the glory of God. That's why Amen. I'm on this stool. Amen. Yeah. That's it. But years ago, I share this with you. As you're close to God, studying at University of North Carolina, my bride and I were dating. And a gentleman that looked as old then as he does now, named Dr. John Perkins, came to speak talking about racial reconciliation, redistribution, relocation. And I said, where did this guy come from? And we read Justice Rolls Down Like a Mighty Stream, and I'm messing up the title, but John, I might get one of your books before I leave. But anyway, <laughs> but we dated, but then we married, and he mentored us. And Tom Skinner and all the great guys that fed into our lives. And years later, we have Patrice, who finishes college, goes back to Lawndale. You all hired her to mentor the young girls. And Dr. Perkins is there speaking. And he said, Patrice, what's your cell phone? You need to meet John John. And that's his grandson. And they talk on the phone. He said, I'm embarrassed. My granddad's making me do this. <laughs> and so they meet, and they marry. And now I have a... <laughs> and they're married. Now I have a grandson named John Philip Perkins. You know. And y'all got to come and see the pictures. This is... You know, Vera Mae and all of them are in here when the baby was dedicated and all that. Now, we're talking about father. The, re the reason why I said that, some of you all are in here that are single. Some of you are sitting here wondering if God can use you. But these young ladies talked about it. I want to tell you something. The greatest thing I can do is not to be a CEO. By the way, CEO in my office is Chief Encouragement Officer. And I, I'm going to share this with you. But here's the thing. You need to be encouraged and to understand. The greatest thing I can do is to be a man of God, a husband, and a father. As I do that, the rest is icing on the cake. You can have a title, but do you have a testimony? And bottom line is, I think about young Chance, our 11-year-old. My older kid said, Daddy, you did not cheat us. Don't cheat Chance. And I travel a lot. He goes with me a lot. But in Malachi, the last verse in the Old Testament, God says, it's his desire that he would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children 
in the hearts of the children to their fathers or the land will be cursed. You look at America today, that's why we're going through what we're going through. Jojo, I don't care what you've been through or the struggles you have. By being there, your husband, come back from Africa, you make those decisions, you will win. Young Chance, every morning when I'm home and when I'm not there, he comes and he leaps in my lap and we read a proverb together. Wisdom. God said, don't read, don't discuss it to, with him. Read it. And I read it. And he listens. And I said, Chance, why do you get in daddy's lap in the morning like this? He's 11. He's getting tall. And he said, Daddy, he doesn't even let me touch him in public. Don't touch my jacket, Dad. Somebody, you know, don't touch me, man. But anyway, but he said this. True story. He said this. He said, Daddy, I like to get in your lap because you're warm. Then he said, it's because you, in fact, uh, I feel safe and secure. But then he said this, I love to smell your coffee breath. <laughs> True story. Now, here's the thing. I'm finding this out. As long as I crawl up in God's lap every morning and get so close I can smell my father's breath, mm. then he will direct us and we will do what we need. I'm going to have a workshop to show oh, yeah, details yeah. about Father's Day. Carrie's doing a workshop at 3 o'clock in the Flamingo Room, I think it is. And it's, my room says the same thing, but I'm going to be in like the Jasmine Room or something. But anyway, uh, Carrie, you can, we can get you to tell some more stories then. I think you got a couple more, don't you? I do. Really. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're just about out of time, and I wish we could go on. The, the wealth that's up on the stage here is so wonderful, but I think maybe we'll just start, and we'll just start with you, Erica, and we'll just go right on down, and kind of a last word. Uh, you two as mothers, you know, to the mothers that are here, to those, uh, what word would you have for the mothers that you just are on your heart, you want to make sure that the mothers know? I think um, one, as I was thinking about this question, um, one of the things that I personally have been wrestling with, as I said before, is valuing family first. And I just want to leave you with a quote from Mother Teresa. It says, it is easy to love those who live far away. It is not easy to love those who live right next to us. It is easier to offer a dish of rice to meet the hungry of a, a hunger of the needy person than to comfort the loneliness and the anguish of someone in our own homes who do not feel loved. Hmm. I want you to go and find the poor in your homes. Above all, your love has to start there. Mm. Good word, good word. Thank word. you, Erica. It's a great word. As I thought about this, um, I thought about uh, the people in the Bible. I thought about Moses' mother, and I thought about Hannah, and then I thought about God the Father himself, who open-handedly offered their children to God and say, we trust you with their journey because you love them more than I ever could. And as a mother, that is hard. It is hard on a daily basis for me to say, God, as much as I love them, I know you love them more and I trust you with their journey. And so my word of encouragement is to do that open-handed parenting where we're called to train and to disciple and to guide, but to offer them trusting that Abba Father loves them even more than we do. All right, thank you. Well, um, you know, as I was thinking about that. Joe, uh, I'd like you to speak as a father, not as a mother. Yes, and that's All a right. father. All right. Well, well, as a father, you know, I, 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 I look at the title, A Healthy Family, and then clearly, you know, um, my life does not describe uh, growing up in a healthy family. I looked at my life as growing up in a survival family. And um, um, the reason I look at it that way, my father, you know, migrated from uh, the South. My mother migrated from the South, and they both struggled uh, greatly. My father was killed when I was nine years old. And then also just, uh, just watching um, and looking at uh, my mother, who had a third grade education, just struggling in that. And then looking out through the neighborhood and seeing what I thought was healthy families, but those same families looked at us like we were outcasts. 
past and, and just growing up that way and always wanting, always desiring to have a healthy family. So it was imperative. It was very important to me to have a family when I grew up. And uh, my wife also grew up on the same block. We grew, both grew up in the same struggle. And, um, but I always had it in my mind that I wanted a family. And one of the things that really uh, uh, was on my heart all the time is that I saw family photos whenever I went to somebody else that had a healthy family. I never had a family photo. So I wanted to get me a family photo one day. And now I have a family photo. And I just want to leave with, um, with everyone or the men, you know, to train the child up in the way that they should go. And uh, as they get older, it never should, should depart from them. So thank you. All right. Good. One of the great things Joe said as well, and I want to let us know, there are no perfect fathers. My dad was not perfect. I'm not perfect. There's only one perfect father. That's our Heavenly Father. But he has the most dysfunctional kids, and I'm one of them. So here's the thing. Living in Lawndale years ago, biggest drug house in the neighborhood was right next door. People remember some of the sermons when I preached there as Wayne and I co-pastored. But we would come out as a family. One day we came out. Little girl came out of the drug house there. And she looked at my bride's finger. And she said, what is that ring? And she said, that's my wedding ring. And she said, you're married to him? And she said, yes, Pastor Casey's my husband. And thinking about how that was foreign to her. But then another time we came out as a family, I'll never forget it, young girl sitting across the street, sitting on the stoop, teenage girl. And she hollered across, one day when I grow up, I'm going to have a family like y'all's. Don't preach a sermon always, you all, but be a sermon. Amen. Amen. Well, I think Carrie illustrates for us that part of our ministry, and I hope you can, can catch this. It's been said every, by everyone. Part of the ministry that we have in our communities is being a healthy family ourselves. We minister to the people around us by being the best husband, by being the best father, by being a godly mother, by being the best mother and wife that we can be wherever we find ourselves. Now, we've just scratched the surface. In CCDA, we have a history of really trying to talk about the struggles of raising. We ask you to have incarnational ministries. It's part of our core values. Living in the city, living in under-resourced communities. And there's lots of problems and struggles as we've heard from our panelists this morning. But yet, we don't want to abandon you in that. We want to walk with you. We've only had just a little bit to talk about, but we don't want to hide it under the carpet. We don't want to say relocate, and then when you have your children, just give up your ministry and move. We want to help you to walk through that. We try to have workshops for that, but that's where the networking and talking is all about things of this nature. So I just want you to know that here in CCDA, I've raised my family in Lawndale with my beautiful wife, Ann, and, you know, it, it, there have been lots of hard times. And... There are struggles, but we can work through those together. We are not here to judge. If your kids don't go to public school, no one in this room will judge you. If you homeschool, we won't judge you. If for a time you feel you have to move out of the community, 1980, I mean, in 1998, uh, Ann and I moved out of Lawndale for three years. It was the hardest decision I ever made in my life. I went around the country telling everybody you have to live in the city if you're going to do Christian community development. And I moved out of Lawndale. My wife Ann helped me. If I hadn't listened to her, I would have probably ruined my kids. It was a family decision. And we did it as a family. And after three years that we needed to be gone, we moved back to Lawndale. I want you to know we want to walk with you. We don't want to judge you. But we want to help you to raise healthy families in the urban environment, in the under-resourced environment, in the poor rural environments. And I want to just take one minute and just pray for every one of you right now. And I want to just, I don't want it to be disruptive, but 
If you are feeling the burden of a family right now, would you stand up right where you are? Let's, 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 let's acknowledge that it's hard with what you're doing. Let's just, just stand and I'm going to pray. Lord, right now, you know there's people standing and they're going through some hard times. And Lord, families are a part of your perfect plan. And yet, Lord, it's hard to raise a family anywhere. And there's extra pressures and extra difficulties and new and different struggles. So, Lord, I pray for everyone. I thank you for those that have shared on our platform today. But I also thank you for everyone that's here, that's relocated, that's, that's striving to be obedient to you. And Lord, I pray for every individual situation. You know those that are standing. You know the discouragement, the anxiety, the fear, the hurt, the danger, the pain that they feel. Lord, we commit them to you right now. You know what it is. I don't know the struggle. You do. We ask that you would help them and help them to listen to your voice and to do what you've called them to do. So we commit them to you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you very much.